first off, why don't you start off with Genova? I mean, tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you into indie gaming so many years ago? Uh, so I came here 2003, um, trying to study film and uh, animation. My goal was originally just be uh, someone who could work at Pixar to make you know, very emotional, touching animations. That, that was my dream. Uh, but as I entered the film school at USC, uh, the school really kind of pushed for, you know, <clears throat> new media. And um, it turns out that I happened to make three games while I was in college as a hobby. Uh, and the, the USC was looking for students who have made games. And I showed them the games and it seems like you know, maybe I, <laughs> I do have some talent in making games. I didn't know that back then. Uh, and so I think it was the summer uh, of 2003. Yeah, so Vince, me, and Rick. Rick was actually the one who started to talk to the school to say, hey, can we make a game for independent game festivals and get paid? Because we don't have money, right? We, we want to get paid over the summer to make a game. Uh, and we made this game called uh, a Dieting, and we submitted it to uh, GDC Indie Festival. And it turns out we won. So, so, and we were like, oh, maybe we do have a talent in this, and we, we can also get paid. And so we proposed to uh, school for, you know, actually making this a serious thing, you know, because student games we made could bring school a lot of attention. It's like free press, and we all, don't have to take like normal standard part-time job to make a living and we can just focus on doing what we love. Uh, and then we made a game called Cloud. Uh, and uh, Cloud got really big uh, in, in the indie community at the time. I think, was IndieCade there? Uh, I think at the time it's still called Slam Dance. This is like IndieCade before it's called yeah, IndieCade. It was, it was before IndieCade. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah, 2005, Vince, me, and Tracy, our, our, t our professor, we went to Salt Lake City to participate. The first, in my mind, is the first Indicate. And it was a small room, maybe, uh, you know, like twice of the space here, like a bunch of small Indies are crammed in a room. Um, and that was a really awesome time because, you know, it's really cold outside in Salt Lake City. So all the Indies just have to stay in this room for like three or four straight days and check out each other's game. Um, and, you know, even though it's, it's a small festival, but having that uh, award for Cloud was a big moment in my life. It's like, maybe, you know, my career should be games, you know. Um, and uh, after Cloud, uh, a lot of people who played our game wrote email to us to say, hey, you, you, sh you should really uh, turn this game into a commercial game. Uh, because most of the game at the time was like very violent, and they want to see, you know, this brings a fresh of air of new type of games. And through those letters and also a lot of naiveness, like somehow I believe because people in Japan and the UK, in Australia, they all write email to me to say you should turn this into a commercial game, it should become a commercial game. So I go around to talk to all the publishers, and, and John was actually. Uh, well, the last publisher I talked to, uh, <laughs> uh, as you can imagine, uh, two crazy kids going around uh, asking for $10 million to turn this student game you know, into, into a commercial uh, CD title of $50, $50 games. And looking back, it's just impossible. And I think it was sheer luck that we ran into John and John didn't publish Cloud, the game. Uh, he published the Flow, the game, uh, which is my thesis project. Um, and, and he was wise enough to say, you know, uh, you, you should start from something smaller, like this Flow game you've already you know, made on web, and move to Cloud eventually. Uh, and now it's 10 years later, I still haven't made the Cloud game. <laughs> So it sounds like it's about time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so Vince, how, how did this all start for you? I mean, did, did you always 
want to pursue music? Was that your love, or how did you fall into this crazy uh, game development scene? Yeah, well, um, I was very much a music games guy, um, and it, it's always sort of flip-flopped. Um, actually, before I was a, a serious music guy, I thought, man, maybe I should just go on this game journalism thing, because I, was, uh, I had a website that I was working on with with some other dudes, and and those other dudes eventually became, you know, really big game journalist guys like uh, like Brandon Sheffield and Tim Rogers and those guys, and they're like, oh yeah, those are game journalists, and I and I was thinking about going that route for a while, um, but I've always wanted to do game music, and yeah, we ended up being at USC together. I I did a few things here and there for other people, other developers. Um, but it always felt weird to me uh, how a lot of other music composers, they sort of move around. They have to sort of move around from project to project. And I've always wanted to just devote myself really deep into one game at a time. And uh, um, I was lucky enough to find a, a few guys that were into that sort of thing where I could have like a really long relationship with not just a game, but, you know, you know these developers that want to try something really cool. So hey, you know I've been I've been working with Genova for, I mean I guess more than a decade now. Mm -hmm. If you count all the school stuff, <laughs> right? If you just count the professional stuff, that's still eight years there, um, which is which is kind of wacky, but uh, yeah, uh, I I'm doing games, I'm doing music, I'm I'm glad I'm doing this, and I wouldn't do anything else. So. When you started with Sony, uh, as it was really Sony's first incubation project with that game company, you kind of went from developing at school to now stepping into creating this game that eventually was going to be commercially released. What what were some of the early learnings, or what was some of the things that you know uh, struck you first about the change that happened as a result of this? Yeah, I, I remember us giving a talk after we made our first commercial launch porting flow from the web to PlayStation. And we were talking at GDC about what we learned. And it still, up to today, what we learned was still applying to most of the students who works on games or indies who's <clears throat> switching to uh, console is like, whatever you think it would take, it would take twice the time. <laughs> uh, when we work on flow, we were thinking, oh, you know, <clears throat> take me three months to make Flow on a browser with one other person. Uh, maybe it will take four months to do a PlayStation version. <laughs> and it, it took us eight to 10 months to make Flow. <clears throat> and then uh, we thought, oh, it took us 10, 10 months to make Flow. It probably the next game, Flower, is going to take 12 months. <laughs> and that took two years. And, and then we were like, well, that was way too long. We made a lot of mistakes. So for Journey, it should be, you know, a little bit less than two years. If we can avoid the mistakes, right? It would be one and a half year, and then it would be three years. <laughs> and, and then this new game, Sky, we thought, ah, Journey was terrible. Three years was way too long. You know, we got to have to keep it two years, and it's already past four-year line. It's probably going to be five years, right? And, yeah, I, I guess we're just... Not good. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an adage, which I'm sure everyone's heard, that you know, we repeat sometimes, and that is, you know, a late game is only late until it ships, but a bad game is bad forever. What do you, mm -hmm. what do you think about that, now that you've got a few under your belt and, and giving what you just said? Uh, it, it's it's uh, way easier to say that than doing it, I think. Um, Every project was always a huge conflict between uh, are you going to drag this out longer or are you going to ship this game w with a disappointment? Um, I mean, even just right now we're talking about Sky. It's, I guess it's, it's a never-ending uh, conflict of life as a developer. Is, you know, when, when are you going to be done? You know? Um, I, mean, I, I think most of the indies prefer the 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 longer route, you know, when it's done, it's done. Um, but in real life, uh, when you drag out a project for long, you you first you may run out of money, run out of saving. Uh, you could also run out of uh, morale. Um, 
I, I think any project lasts more than five years, you lose a, at least one third of your people. And same thing for me. Uh, but I, I agree with, with, with what you said there, right? If, if you do it right, it will be a late game. But if you don't do it right, it will be forgotten. Um, yeah. Well, you know, and you said bad game, and I, you know, that it's always that perspective. When I'm looking back at a game, it's uh, that I've completed. It's hard not to see the bad things. Like, um, you know, recently we did this whole thing with Flower on iOS, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at the bad stuff. I'm looking at, <laughs> oh, that was really sloppy. How I did stuff in that level, and wow, did I really design that flower sound that way? I should have done this. And like, oh, it, you know, after working on something for so long, you know, flower's a pretty short game, but two years uh, was spent on that. And, and now I'm, there's actually, even now, a little bit of regret for, whoa, I really did that in that level. Wow, why did I do that? Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I'm glad that it, still has that life and I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm glad that I can actually push myself to recognize what it is but still it is a push naturally I think whoa all those things that I messed up 10 years ago it, it, it's very strange because even until last year I always pretend I'm still young I'm still a student out of school I'm working on these new games really uh, you know exciting and trying to change the status quo and trying to be a you know a, a, a kid off school but this year, for some reason, I mean, especially like right now, there's a lot of things happening where I look back, I'm like, man, I'm really old. This, I'm just reminiscing of, of the past, like, like what Vince was saying. We were looking at Flower, because recently it was ported to the iOS. I was like, this game, whoever made it was having a lot of angst and ego. And he's trying way too hard, trying to please me. <laughs> and I, I wasn't able to have that. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, because I I was still basically looking at the game as myself. But today, after so long, after five years of Flower, I was able to look at Flower from a very neutral perspective. Yeah, and uh, it was a very naive game, but a very pure game. Uh, I like the guy who was <laughs> the young guy who was trying too hard there. I I know he tried way too hard, so I, I feel like it's sincere. But at the same time, I know it didn't quite work. But I would never have that feeling uh, if it, it hasn't been this long. Uh, look at your own product. Mm. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think it was honest. I, I, th I think you were honest. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah, and uh, I remember John one day while we were working on Flower, he called me into the office. Uh, I, I talked this a lot, and and he was saying. You know, you know what? You just have too much ego right now. You need to work on a few of these games to let your ego out so that you can really focus on the real stuff and make some money. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so you can imagine as a kind of young student out of grad school who was all about, you know, making game as art, you know, touch people and making money wasn't anything I was thinking about. I was really... Uh, upset when John said that to me. Uh, and I'm like, I'm going to prove you wrong, John. <laughs> uh, but now, you, you know, it's been 10 years since we started TGC. Uh, and uh, some of you might know, like at the end of journey, our company is really running out of money. And uh, that really kind of taught me a lesson. Um, and changed my view of the world quite a lot. And the funny thing is, like now, I'm 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 seeing John here, and it was like, I am working on a game. I want to make sure the game does make the money, <laughs> and uh, I don't have that much ego left here. I want to make sure the company, everybody, can be uh, you know, well compensated for this project. You know, five years is a long time, and I want it to be a success, and. I guess that's just the passage of getting older and become mature. Uh, but yeah, it, it's just all coming together. I'm, I'm like, now I'm thinking about John's word. It is actually really wise. I just could not take it when I was a kid. Uh, anyway.
So I, I guess I'm really curious, you know, especially with 10 years later with Indiecade, how's the indie scene different now than it was then? I think start, start with you, Vince. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I want both of you guys to answer this. Wow. Man. Well, let's see. Um, I mean, definitely my perspective on the indie scene was very much uh, formed by Indiecade itself. You know, um, a lot of my memories of those indie games were... I mean, I'm thinking about those games that I played. Okay, you got some some cool games that you download, some Flash games, um, Congregate. What, you know, you have all these games on the web. And um, I actually remember a lot of those personalities. And, and I'm thinking back to IndieCade back in Culver City and going to the, the WGA and all the different galleries that are there and talking to the, those kids. And I remember thinking at that time, because I was about 25 years old, during those 25, 26 years old, during those first Indiecades in Culver City. And uh, these kids were making all these interesting things. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think um, the, the dude who made Closure, I think he was 15 or 16 years old at the time. He was a high school student when he was making this game and I was talking to him. And I was thinking, wow, this is a great idea, and you've got some great ideas. Um, and being connected to all these different kids at the time was really awesome to me. Um, I think it's still the case nowadays where you have all of this young talent that's coming out and, and making these games and putting it out there. But I feel less of an impact of who these people are and, and where these people actually came from compared to that really those really close encounters that I had a decade ago. I, I don't think, I actually am not sure that that much has changed. I think the impact is still there and all this, all these fresh ideas are still coming out there, but I'm, I'm, I'm just a bit less connected to who these developers are as people, unless I really work at it, and I see them at, at places like this. Yeah, I mean, the first Slam Dance Festival, we were forced to be locked in with all the other indies for four days, you know, from the morning to the night. So we had to socialize and interact, so we get to know them very well. Like, uh, the, that first Slam Dance, we were lock, locked in with this team called uh, Nab Nabacular Job from uh, DigiPan. And if you played Portal, you know, these are the guys who actually made the original concept, and then they were hired by Valve. Uh, yeah, and also that's where I met my, uh, you know, I guess TGC employee number one, which is uh, John Edwards. Uh, he was the lead engineer for a very long time, for the past 10 years. And we also met him in, and his team in the same room. So, like, all these social connections really helped, you know, have become meaningful over, over the years. Um, but I guess now Indicate is just so much bigger. And the space for us to really socially connect is... Uh, somehow, like, much less dense. Um, but I, you just can't help it. I mean, the world has so many indies, we can't cram everybody in a tiny room anymore. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's, it's weird. Like, today our communication is so much better than 10 years ago. I mean, we, we don't have a smartphone before. Um, but somehow, maybe because of the, the easy access, I find it's actually less likely to have a personal connection. Uh, maybe I'm just too old or something, but I, I felt like uh, back then it was easier to, to connect to indies. Yeah, I mean, before, yeah, there was, I mean, Facebook wasn't as big. Uh, you know, now it is really easy to make the superficial connections. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, and it wasn't, and it was really quite difficult back then. But once you made that connection, it just, you couldn't help but get something that was much, much closer and much richer of a connection. And, and you can still have that now. It's just, it's, it's actually a lot of work. And that work is sort of compounded with all the other stuff that's out there. Because it's not just one person in a room that you're dealing with. It's uh, one person in a really, really crowded room, and there's all this stuff that's around you. 
Um, and uh, it's I, and now I actually have to rely on so many other close friends in order to curate, help curate some of those connections that I want to pursue, whether it be to a game or to a person. Uh, I mean, the, the indie space is so crazy. <laughs> it's, there's so much awesome stuff that's going on right now. Um, I'm actually sort of resurrecting some of these uh, connections mm. that I was uh, looking at in Korean indie game development, which it was just such a wacky place. Um, there used to be so few of them, you know, specific things back a decade ago. PC, obviously a huge influence on how MMOs were designed back in the day. But it's, it's so cool to actually see the, the Korean indies and, and some of the student games that are coming out of there. Mm -hmm. uh, just, <laughs> it's, it's so fun. And, th and that's such a cool place to sink my energy into. And I realized I'm sinking more energy into that than into the stuff that's actually coming out yeah. here. And then I have there, to bounce there, back. There's definitely this feeling of exhaustion. Uh, I mean, it's like that movie, No Country for Old Men. You know, it's like we are old <laughs> men now. Like, Back then, uh, in 2005... Yeah, no, you're not really old man. <laughs> <laughs> I know what an old man is. <laughs> well, well, we'll hear from your perspective. Two, two, 2005, uh, I think the people... Uh, back, back then, to make your game published uh, on a commercial platform, there's only consoles. And so console has very rigorous... Uh, you know, vesting, and it takes a lot more money to make it than what you could do a game today. You guys really were the first indie game to go to console. Mm -hmm. uh, Sony was a year behind Microsoft. Right. Um, I had the challenge of going up against Xbox Live and couldn't have the catalog that they had in that short time period. Mm -hmm. So did a different route and decided to go after very artistic games, you know, which Flow was you know kind of the flagship game to, to start all that and led to a lot of indies being attracted to working with Sony and, and, mm -hmm. and being out on PSN. So now that we're 10 years later, uh, or more than that when we first talked about Flow, but do you feel like console was the right platform for you? Is that the best way for you to start the company and, and get your entree? Or? I mean, back then, that's the only way you can... Well, Steam yeah. was starting off. I mean, there was certainly an indie scene happening oh, on the PC. 2005, when I talked to Steam, they were like, oh, this great game is great, but... Our player on the platform only plays shooters, and this is not a shooter. So, yeah, 2005. Uh, I think it was 2010, that's when Steam is like, hey, we want to become an independent platform now. Indies, we care about you. But back then, we have no choice. I, I, I think if, if it wasn't for Sony, we would probably just be working for some big company. You know, today is... The world has changed completely. Yeah. Well, I know uh, when we were trying to categorize your game, because Sony was very retail oriented, mm -hmm. even though we were doing it as a downloadable game, they asked me, you know, what is the what is the category of of you know flow? What's the category? For, actually, it was flower, you know, because they wanted it in a very rigid. Is it a shooter? Is it an RTS? Whatever. And I went to you and I asked you, so what is the category of this game? You remember what you told uh -huh. me? Uh. I, I, I don't I don't but uh, lately people have been saying all your games are snake games you know you you eat and you grow a snake. Well, it was a little, it was a little nicer than that. It was kind of funny. It, yeah. we, we, he called it a Zen game, <laughs> and so I went back to the the marketing people at Sony. And I said, yeah, it's a Zen game. Really? They said, no, we don't have that on here. And I said, we need to add it. So they added Zen to the list of categories. I don't know if it's still there. I, I, I think it's still there. I remember discovering it. Um, it wasn't really. Um, up front in the American PR, but on the Japanese side, you know, they always have that something that says, oh, genre what? And it said Zen Adventure. I was like, wow, that's cool. Yeah, I think it's a misunderstanding, John. I think we... <laughs> uh -oh. back, back then, I've been talking about flow as a psychological theory. Uh, and flow theory and flow, it's kind of like a, it's a flow state. And did I use Zen? Because when people tell me your game is a Zen game, and even today, people think, uh, oh, Jiro makes Zen games. I was like, man, that's because John made up that genre, and now I'm stuck with it. <laughs> and the truth comes out after all these years. Yeah. <laughs> so if I just called it a shooter, your whole life would have been different? Is it? I mean, because people, 
think, assume I'm some kind of, uh, you know, meditation practitioner, you know, into a, 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 yeah, a, a stoner game designer or something, you know? Yeah. Flower was always a hardcore flight sim. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so hardcore. There's actually a lot of virtuosity that you can do with the controller. Uh, I actually had a lot of fun. Uh, you know, when I was working on it, I would just go to the office and uh, uh, fire up the dev kit. And, oh, I am going to challenge myself to see if I can trigger three different cutscenes at the same time with really precise control on the well, six axis. Because you are a really hardcore gamer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it allowed me to be that. It, it allowed me to do that, which I really appreciated. I think the, the thing that was really interesting, especially Flower, was when I'd hear pitches for games, it was always, well, it's like this meets that. And, they, and, and developers would tend to reference one game combined with another game. And I asked you, you know, what, what, was your, what approach did you want to take on Flower? And you said, well, I first start with what emotional response do I want to evoke in, in, in the player? Mm -hmm. And uh, and in this case, you told me catharsis. Um, how did how does this come about? I mean, I mean, it was a, it was a very unique. I'd never heard anything like this. I mean, where did you develop this idea of this is how you were going to make games? Uh, actually, um, yeah, this is this is this is a deep subject. Uh, when we were in school and the indie scene was booming uh, in the early two thousands. Uh, everybody have played Jonathan Blow's game, uh, Braid, right? We all play Braid. Uh, and within school, we've been taught about innovating games around inventing new gameplay mechanism. Uh, and rewinding time was like, oh my God, I can't imagine how he come up with this idea. It's so brilliant, right? Uh, and Portal, it's a nebacular job. It's like Portal concept. I've never seen anything like this. This is amazing. And they turned that into an amazing game. And so everybody in the school was pushing for mechanical innovation. Uh, and at the time, I was uh, studying in the film school. And um, one thing I realized was film is always about how, how it makes you feel. If you look at the, the genres, right? horror film makes you feel scared. Uh, comedy makes you feel happy. And if you look at novel, how the genre was breaking down, uh, and music and film, they're always about feeling. But I had at the time, I had a, a weird realization looking at video game genres. It's all about software. It's about features. It's like first-person shooter versus third-person shooter, top-down shooter versus side-scrolling shooter, uh, role-playing game versus massively multiplayer online role-playing game, right? But they never talk about the feelings of the game. You know, it, it, it's like uh, uh, you can have a, a driving simulator. They call it the driving simulator or a racing game. A serious racing game is Gran Turismo, but Twisted Metal is also a racing game, right? But you shoot rockets at people. And, and, and what is that genre, right? And, and I realized just the way, uh, and uh, the other thing I noticed is uh, there's only two industry uh, where people describe uh, their customer as users. Uh, I think software and sex toys, uh, <laughs> right? Like other industry, we would describe their customer as audience, you know, for entertainment. And I, I think for quite a long time, the you know, game has user menus. Like I, I just feel like, you know, if, if I grew up playing games, I, I love games, and I, I, some of the great games touched me deeply, and it was more like a literature to me than a software. And um, so studying cinema helped me to realize that, oh, we could have done game this way to make it more emotional, to, to touch you in a way that a great storyteller could do. Uh, but we're doing it through gameplay itself. So I guess my focus was more on how to use the game, the simple gameplay, but through its change of intensity to really create a climatic emotion. Uh, the other frustration I had at the time was there's like Final Fantasy XII. I was trying to play that game, uh, but 
the gameplay was so grindy. Every day after work, I came back home wanting to play Final Fantasy, but I have to level up to certain level before I can see the next part of the great storytelling. And eventually, I just gave up. I got stuck in somewhere because uh, you know, because I was trying to skip through. I was, I was trying to level up as little as I could. I wanted to see the rest of the the epic saga. And eventually, I ran into a forest where I was so low level, and I was stuck in there. I couldn't. Uh, it's 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 like in order to leave the forest, you have to reach certain level. But my level was so low. I got stuck and was really frustrated. I'm like, why is this game creating all this gameplay, which has nothing to do with what I really wanted? And and I, I, at the time, you know, in the early 2000s, a lot of games were trying to be as cinematic as, as cinematic as they could to make you feel emotional. But when they do that, they are not as good as the filmmakers, and uh, the 3D low poly model is not as good as the actors. It always feels like a losing battle. It doesn't really stir your feeling. And uh, the game that actually touches you are sometimes very simple graphics indie games, like Jason Rohr's The Passage. And I realized that gameplay is so key for emotional intensity. And, and it, it, it just makes me realize that, I think I got off track. But, uh, at the time, yeah, I, I really want to touch people. That is the goal, because otherwise I would go to work for Pixar, right? But I want a game to touch people, and yeah. emotion is the, the, the most important thing for me. We need to have time for you to show us something special, uh, but I'm so happy that you guys have pursued this. You've brought some delight both to me and to millions of people out there, and uh, I'm very proud that we've been able to keep our friendship over all these years, despite me... Uh, making you angry about uh, pursuing a monetary <laughs> no, no, concern. It comes around, you know. Yeah, yeah that's cool, man. So what do you got for us here? We got a, a special treat. Mm -hmm.